Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's presentation, The Rise and Rise of Apache Spark, uh, brought to you by 451 Research, Cubol, and featuring Autodesk, uh, during which we will try to answer the question, is Spark the answer to all questions posed for big data? Uh, during this uh, stimulating webinar, we will hear from Steve Gottlieb, big data guru at Autodesk, who will dive into how developers and data scientists are using Spark notebooks to prototype data transformations that can be deployed through an automated ETL pipeline and delivered to data analysts to enable faster time to insights. Also joining in the fun will be Damesh Dash Desai, technology evangelist for Cubol, who will take a look at the real value of a self-service analytics platform and how this value is realized when both business users and data team members have access to raw and aggregated data from a range of sources. And finally, myself, Matt Aslett, Research Director at 451 Research, will kick off the discussion around the impact of the rise of Apache Spark on the big data ecosystem. So before I begin, just wanted to remind you to log any questions along the way uh, using the console on the left-hand side, and we will take those at the end of uh, all three presentations. Uh, without further ado, um, I'll kick off. And just to give you a very brief introduction to 451 Research uh, before we get into the presentation itself. Uh, so we're an industry uh, research and advisory company focused in 2000 with uh, 250 plus employees, including over 100 analysts, over 1,000 clients, which includes technology and service providers, corporate advisory, finance, professional services, and IT decision makers. And, and the last thing I'll mention on this slide uh, the next number and the most important number, I think, on this slide is 50,000 plus. That's um, the number of IT professionals, business users, and consumers that we have within our research community. So those are people out there in the field, practitioners working with technology you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, and they increasingly shape our research, we shape our view on, on the world uh, by working with us in terms of doing surveys and interviews, and uh, an increasingly important part of uh, 451 Research. In terms of our research, um, we deliver both written research and obviously data across a range of, of channels, 15 channels from the data center uh, technologies um, uh, right through to, to the mobile edge with enterprise mobility and mobile telecom. And the area that I cover, I'm a research director for data platforms uh, and analytics, uh, which is, which is roughly right in the, in the middle of, the, uh, of, of this slide here. So the key question we're talking about today is, is uh, about Apache Spark. And in a few short years, the Apache Spark in memory data processing engine has risen from you know, pretty much nowhere to become one of the most important projects in the Hadoop ecosystem. And for some, the anointed successor to MapReduce as Hadoop's primary data processing engine. Uh, certainly, you know, we're, when we were recently putting together our trends uh, you know, perspectives for, for the next year, uh, this was definitely one of the, the, the key trends that we are highlighting that Spark, you know, will, will begin to emerge as the, not just one of, of the most important technologies behind use cases for Hadoop, but actually, you know, potentially the dominant uh, technology behind use cases for Hadoop. Um, in terms of just setting the scene, I'm sure a lot of people obviously on this webinar are aware of Spark and, and, and understand it. Otherwise, you know, they, they wouldn't have been interested in the webinar in the first place. But just to level set and be absolutely clear for perhaps some people who have not come across it before, what is Spark? Well, it's Spark is an in-memory data processing engine. It's based on the directed uh, a click. I knew I was going to have problems with that. Uh, let's just call it DAG concept. Um, and it supports applications written in Java, Scala, or Python. Um, as well as the core in memory data processing engine, it also has a number of key sub projects, specifically Spark Streaming, Spark SQL, MLlib, uh, and GraphX. Um, you know, what, it, was it, what is it for? It's designed to complement Apache Hoop. Uh, so you can use Spark. Uh, to read and write data to and from the Hadoop distributed file system, as well as other, uh, you know, other components of the Hadoop uh, ecosystem, including HBase and, and other uh, data platforms as well, such as Cassandra and, and AWS S3 for cl uh, cloud storage. Um, however, you know, one of the things about Spark is it's not just 
uh, something that can be deployed uh, alongside HDFS. It can also run standalone. Uh, as we say here, it can run on top of Apache Yarn. It could also run with things like Apache Mesos and the Eluxio uh, in-memory file system. And it's important, even though we talked about you know, Spark obviously being an in-memory data processing engine, uh, it's important to note that Spark is not limited to data stored in memory. So it can spill to disk uh, or recompute partitions that don't fit, uh, fit in RAM. Just to give a sense of, of kind of the evolution of Spark over time, uh, you know, with, with this timeline, so you can see that the project was actually conceived at the University of California, Barclays Amp Lab, uh, in 2009. It was first released as an open source project initially using the Berkeley license in 2010, switched to the Apache license with version uh, 0 0.8 in 2013, shortly after it had become an Apache Software Foundation incubation project in early 2013. Uh, and actually pretty quickly went through that incubation, incubation process. So uh, about a year later became a top level uh, Apache Software Foundation project, and version uh, 1.0 followed quickly after that uh, in, in mid-2014. Version 2, is the, which is the, the, you know, the most recent major release, was released in mid-2016. And the other thing that we've highlighted on, on this slide uh, references Cloud Air as one platform initiative uh, towards the end of 2015. Um, you know, this is one initiative from one vendor, but it was quite an important one because for a while, certainly in, in private conversations we'd been having with, you know, with, with vendors in the Hadoop space, there had been an increasing um, acknowledgement that uh, you know, Spark could be the long-term successor to MapReduce as the core uh, processing engine in the Hadoop ecosystem. But this announcement uh, from Cloudera was the first time we'd seen you know, one of the prominent vendors in this space actually voicing that you know, publicly and saying, you know, not just it could be, but if as far as they were concerned, it was going to be, and they were going to put some effort in to make sure that it was. So, you know, a, a significant uh, endorsement. But one of many uh, for Spark, obviously, you know, with any um, successful open source project, you see, um, you know, a, a whole range, a whole ecosystem of vendors uh, supporting that. So in addition to uh, Cloudera, and we've seen MapR, and Hortonworks, and IBM, and Google, and, and, and Microsoft through Azure, and AWS through EMR, and, and also you know, a, a, uh, the, the founders of uh, Spark at AmpLab actually founded uh, Databricks in, uh, in, in uh, mid-2013. So there's a, a good ecosystem of, of projects out there. And, and the other one to mention, obviously, in terms of uh, the participants on today's webinar, so Qbol, uh, you know, fairly early to this, and especially in terms of, of, you know, in terms of as a service support um, in early 2015, announcing support for Spark on the Qbol data service. Um, but the, I think one of the key things that we've seen around Spark, and, and that's um, you know driven us to conclude that it, it you know it's it's more significant even than you know the the level of adoption we've seen from the Hadoop, Hadoop ecosystem, is the level of adoption we've seen in the wider ecosystem. So throughout you know the recent years, we've seen a number of vendors. Um, you know, in the data integration space, in the analytics space, in advanced analytics, in machine learning, um, using Spark as a, you know the the engine for them delivering uh, additional you know performance and high performance analytics or integration, um, and and so you know what we certainly saw is that. Uh, Spark has almost become the, the default in a very short space of time, uh, the default way in which those uh, ISVs deliver high performance integration and analytics, you know, either standalone or as part of, the, uh, of a Hadoop deployment. Um, uh, just another indicator in terms of sort of the momentum we've seen. So this is uh, you know, a chart from, from Google Trends. And as you can see, we're comparing uh, with MapReduce here and if you look at the you know the sort of the interest over times in terms of uh, Google searches, uh, a very significant uh, growth for Apache Spark in recent years. Perhaps more significantly, this chart, which actually comes from uh, Stack Overflow. So this isn't just about general interest. This is interest from developers. People are out there actually you know choosing technologies to use in their projects. And, and you can see, actually, if anything, the, 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 the chart shows an even accelerated rate of growth in terms of the level of, of interest and questions being asked around Apache Spark 
uh, compared to, to MapReduce. So why Spark? I mean, we talked about what it is, we talked about what it does, but why Spark in, in particular? And there's a number of reasons that we've seen uh, you know, in our research that, that organizations are particularly drawn to Spark. Um, one of those is the fact that it's, it's open source, which means it's freely available. We talked about the Apache software license. So it's, it, you know, it's a very permissive license. It's very flexible. That's one of the reasons we see you know, ISVs are particularly drawn to it, but also you know, end users as well. It's, it's a true community development project. So we talked about all those vendors uh, that are, that are uh, uh, supporting a, you know, Spark in their, either in their Hadoop distributions or in their big data as a service uh, offerings. And you know, a lot of those organizations, if you can see the, the list at the bottom here, uh, lists the current committers to the, the, the Spark project. And you see a lot of those vendors we mentioned there, but you also see a lot of end user organizations. And you also see you know, sort of some vendors uh, from that wider ecosystem as well. Uh, in addition to you know, research organizations, academia. So it's a very, um, uh, you know, it, it's a true community and it's a varied community as well. Um, it's also one of the most active open source projects. There's significantly more activity around uh, Spark in recent years than there has been, as, well, especially if you compare it to something like, like MapReduce. And, and as we mentioned, because of that ecosystem, there's widespread support for Spark out there. So, you know, a lot of times, People assume because it's an open source project, that means you can go to different vendors and get support you know, for that. I think in, in the case of Spark, that's absolutely true, that there are multiple vendors out there that will, that will assist you uh, with Spark in terms of services, in terms of uh, you know, software, in terms of support, in terms of uh, as a service deployments. Of course, because um, Spark uh, is an in-memory data processing engine, one of the other prime reasons that we see organizations look at Spark is performance. You know, it's native support for running in memory. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail on performance. I think Dash is going to provide some examples of this later on. But you know, the, the, the standard sort of baseline claims are up to 10% faster than MapReduce on disk, up to 100% faster than MapReduce running in memory. And also, it's, it's beyond batch. Whilst uh, you know, Spark is at heart a batch processing framework, it does enable interactive query. And finally, um, flexibility. Um, I think you know when we first looked at Spark, obviously you know we, we saw that there was going to be interest in it because it was open source, because it's you know high, enables high performance analytics. But I think the thing that most struck us looking at this uh, was actually the flexibility that you have in terms of the ways in which you can use it and and the ways in which you can deploy it. Um, so you know we already talked about you know uh, Spark supporting multiple. Uh, sub-projects, so Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, MLlib, GraphX. You know, you can use Java, you can use Scala, you can use Python, you can use R to, to uh, write applications to run on Spark. You can connect to it using your standard BI tools, using ODBC and JDBC. And as we mentioned earlier, you can deploy it on HDFS via YARN. You can deploy it standalone. You can deploy it on Mesos. You can deploy it on other things, including Alluxio, S3, Cassandra, and HBase. So there's a great amount of flexibility and choice uh, for organizations in terms of the way in which they can use that platform, the applications and the workloads they can deploy on Spark, and you know, they, they can use their existing, in a lot of time, cases, their existing skills and their existing tools and bring those to Spark, not necessarily having to learn you know, a, new, a new platform and new languages. <coughs> Uh, just briefly, in terms of some of the, the use cases, and obviously, you know, we'll, we'll go into a lot more detail on this with some of the, you know, the other presenters. But you know, at a high level, interactive query, you know, high performance analysis using SQL, using SQL, using R, using Python, using visualization tools, you know, in concert with with existing Visual BI software. Uh, stream processing, so including things like event detection, streaming ETL, integration with static data. And some examples of that, common examples we see, ad targeting, personalization, fraud detection, recommendation engine. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, machine learning is another uh, common use case, obviously, with the, the MLLib project. So enabling predictive intelligence, things like customer segmentation, behavioral, behavioral uh, another word to stumble over, uh, analysis, and sentiment analysis, and, and also you know, uh, anything these days, there's always an IoT angle, and absolutely in terms of sort of IoT edge computing, the low latency analytics that, that you, can, you can be enabled using Spark 
uh, it makes it a potential, uh, you know, potential for deployment at the edge of the network to enable streaming and machine learning and graph analysis, for example, at the edge of the network. It's important, though, I think, to, you know, to, to, to be aware here, although, you know, obviously we're, we're talking about the rise and rise of Spark, and we see Spark as a very significant part of the, the big data ecosystem, if you like. You know, it isn't a, a panacea. It, it doesn't solve all, you know, all use cases. And, you know, this chart really is designed to kind of illustrate that, you know, even if you're deploying Spark standalone, which we see an increasing number of organizations are doing, very often it's standalone but alongside Hadoop and alongside other projects within the Hadoop ecosystem. And certainly, you know, we see in terms of sort of the, the, the main sort of core user base, Spark is very much, you know, being, being used by sort of data engineers and data scientists. And you can, you know, as we mentioned, you can connect your BI tools to that environment to enable access to that data in Spark by data analysts and business users. But, you know, there are other ways of doing that. There's other projects within the wider Hadoop big data ecosystem that, you know, arguably, arguably might be better suited for that. So I don't want to give the impression we're saying, you know, Spark is good for everything. I'm sure we can go into more detail on this, you know, in the, in the, in the questions later. But just to illustrate that, you know, it is part of a, a, a bigger picture. But finally, just for, from my perspective, just to conclude, you know, as we talked about, Apache Spark is one of the fastest growing big data projects in terms of both contributions, the actual, you know, the project itself is growing rapidly, and also in terms of user adoption. We've seen significant growth in terms of user adoption in the, in the, in the last few years. Um, you know, we see the key advantages for Spark that it provides a flexible platform for in-memory data processing, and I talked about, you know, supporting multiple languages, multiple engines, multiple deployment options, and therefore multiple use cases. It, you know, it isn't a panacea. Let's, you know, we don't, we don't want to give that impression. But, you know, absolutely we see, as I talked about right at the start, you know, in terms of our sort of uh, predictions for 2017, you know, we'll see it, it actually will become not just one of the most significant uh, technologies behind use cases for Hadoop and big data analytics, but actually uh, arguably the dominant technology for those use cases. So uh, with that, I want to thank you for your time. Just to remind you, uh, I see some of you already uh, sending across uh, questions, so thank you for those. Um, we'll get to those later on. Um, you've got my contact uh, details here if you've got any questions you know, for me directly about 451. But for now, I'll hand you over to Dash at uh, Qbol, and, um, and from there, we'll, we'll hear from uh, Steve at uh, Autodesk. So for now, thanks very much for your time. Great. Thank you so much, Matt, for uh, laying down a great foundation for, uh, for our webinar today. Um, hello, everyone. This is uh, Dharmesh, or Dash Desai from Cubal. Um, I'm a tech evangelist. And um, for those listeners that are not familiar with Cubal, it's the uh, fastest um, and the only cloud-native big data platform that's designed from the ground up to scale. It was founded by the creators of Apache Hive project and uh, the same people that led the uh, data service team at Facebook, um, their names being um, Joy Deep Sharma and Ashish Tuso. Uh, it was founded in 2011. Um, so just to give you an idea of enterprise scale and readiness of the platform, uh, Let's look at some numbers that are on the slide. Uh, Cubal today processes about uh, 500 petabytes of data per month compared to all the other uh, leading in our brand. So this should give you an idea of how much efforts have gone into creating this platform that's enabling these companies um, and a lot of the customers across the board become more data driven, uh, which kind of brings up uh, the next slide, uh, the vision of the company being to help companies become data driven like I mentioned and also to democratize data and lower burden on IT teams as well as uh, you know the data teams across the enterprises. And this has been made possible by providing a, a solved service big data platform uh, with these three elements um, being being at the core, the first one being the architecture that's you know built to be agile, flexible, and scales. 
Uh, we already saw the, some of the numbers uh, in one of our earlier slides. Uh, that kind of gives you an idea of the, the, um, the rigid, you know, the enterprise scale of, of the platform. The second one is automation and transparency of infrastructure. We'll get into that uh, in a little bit, and also uh, how the platform provides the simple tools and interfaces for um, their team members across the uh, enterprises. So let's get, get into the, the first one, architecture built to be agile, flexible, and scalable. In a traditional big data Hadoop deployment, Compute and storage, they live together. This forces them to scale up and down together as well, which is not really ideal because then elasticity is much harder to achieve and manage, right? And this also means that you have to provision for peak. Data science and big data workloads, as we all know, um, are often bursty and unpredictable, so provisioning for peak can lead to underutilized resources, and also, um, you know, it could drive up the uh, total cost of ownership because of that. Uh, the other side effect of having compute and storage together is the clusters mu must stay on, otherwise data becomes unavailable, right? So one of the important benefits of moving to the cloud is the, uh, the possibility of decoupling storage and compute. Storage is getting cheaper and compute can be very expensive. So by separating the two, their teams can achieve greater elasticity uh, and more agility within the, uh, within the organization. And the idea is to use uh, persistent storage service such as uh, Amazon S3 as you see in, on the slide and computing power selectively and more importantly on demand. So by doing this, what happens is you have the storage that's centralized and computation is distributed, which means resources scale based on the workload. For example, compute heavy versus storage heavy, right? Moreover, it's also easier and faster to test new technologies such as Spark. So you don't have to have, you know, you don't get locked into these infrastructures where trying out a new engine or new data processing uh, uh, technology, you would have to go through these, you know, uh, overhead of creating new clusters and, and maintaining and managing those. And which brings up to uh, the next uh, attribute, which is flexibility, where every cluster can be brought up and down independently of each other, right? And, and you know, they run at cloud scale with individual clusters scaling to thousands of nodes. Moving on to the, uh, the automation and transparency aspect of the uh, self-service platform. So Cubol has taken a, a very different approach in that it lets data team members to focus on the analysis part, the, the data science part, and then automates everything around it. For example, as seen on the slide, once the query is formulated and executed, it automatically deploys, the platform automatically deploys the cluster, and when finished, the cluster terminates automatically. And as you can see, uh, the drop down on the right hand side, the, the dots, those are all the clusters that you have available for you to run against uh, this query in this example. The other big aspect of Cubol as a self-service big data platform is uh, auto-scaling. On the right-hand side, you will see that the, the cluster is pre-configured to have a minimum of four nodes, and then several auto-scaling nodes are brought up or down depending on the workloads. So you could go from, say, for example, two nodes to thousand nodes, thousands, in, in fact. And the way auto scaling is structured or architected within the platform is it's policy driven. So you pre-configure the clusters based on your workloads or your uh, big data processing engines, what have you. And then when the platform needs to either bring up a cluster or create a cluster from scratch, it uses that as a template or blueprint uh, in real time, just in time. 
And like mentioned before, the cluster scales up and down. So all of that has been taken out of um, the, the, your day-to-day -day operations, if you will. And all the cluster types that are supported are listed on the slide. As you can see, Spark, Hadoop 2, and Yarn, Hadoop, and uh, Presto. The other big attribute or uh, uh, feature as part of the uh, self-service big data platform is also a support for spot instances. Spot instances are uh, resources or machines that Amazon puts out in a, in, in a bidding style market where you, know, you can bid for machines for your workloads. All of that has been automated within the platform so you don't have to worry about uh, the pricing and you know, when to bid for one or not. It also has ability to fall back on on-demand instances um, depending on the workload and the use case. And these are all instantiated in customer's account so they are secured within your VPC or subnets or what have you. Moving on to the, uh, the next section where Q the big Qbol as a big data service platform provides REST APIs as well as web-based interface for every action that you can think of basically. Uh, right from SQL editor to command debugging, we also have uh, an extension of Zeppelin um, integrated into the platform, uh, notebooks. You can have various reports created out of the platform for cluster usage uh, per user per instance. There's uh, integration with Ganglia as well as um, you know Tableau and so forth. And a lot of different things that have been put into place for team collaboration, for example, integration with GitHub within the notebook and um, also being able to comment, uh, share resources right from, from the same interface. And now we'll look at some of the screenshots of these different aspects of the platform. So the first one that I wanted to touch base on is uh, Notebooks. It's an extension of Zeppelin. And data analysts, for example, can view, run, and visualize results of SQL, Scala, Python, in a single collaborative environment. They can also iterate quickly with saved queries. And queries and results are always persisted, so you can view them even the cluster is not running. So that's kind of cool. And there's also ability to create multiple notebooks targeting different engines and clusters. And like mentioned before, there's GitHub integration for version control and tracking changes as well as collaborating with other team members. Here's another example of um, out-of-the-box feature where if you had latitude, longitude data set or, or you know, columns within your, within your query or data set, you can um, plot those on, on a map. And this is all um, out-of-the-box available for data team members to use. The next interface I wanted to touch base on a little bit was um, Explore. This is where data team members, data engineers, um, admins go to either explore your current Hive Metastore, uh, unified Hive Metastore that's used and accessed across clusters, and you can also browse through all your data stored in, in the cloud right from this interface. So that's, uh, that's pretty handy. Uh, the, the next interface I wanted to touch base a little bit on was the, uh, is the scheduler. Uh, data engineers can use this to schedule queries, commands at specific inter intervals. They can build workflows and schedule jobs. Um, targeting multiple engines, including Spark, Spark SQL, Presto, and they can also actually import and export data from external data sources. One of the cool features of this uh, scheduler is you can add dependencies. So you could say run a particular job only if uh, a Hive partition exists or an S3 file is, uh, is there in a, in, in a given bucket. Um, speaking a little bit about Apache Spark momentum on, on Qbol, uh, to accommodate Growing demands and leverage technological advancements made by the uh, 
Apache Spark community, Cubo continues to release enhancements and optimizations pertaining to Spark offered as a service. So here are some of the highlights that I wanted to touch base on a little bit. The first one being support for Spark 2.0. And um, the second one being the uh, GitHub integration. So it allows data team members to share and restore entire state of a notebook without having to rewrite queries or commands even when the associated cluster is not running. So that's great. Uh, the next one is uh, we've optimized split computations for Spark SQL, which means AWS S3 listings enable split computations to run significantly faster on Spark SQL queries. So as, as Matt referred to earlier, there's a, a lot of different things that the community is doing to, to uh, to make you know Spark platform uh, more you know performant, and and Cubo's done uh, a, a few things of their own as well. So in this particular case, uh, speaking about split computation, if you have large number of partitions in Hive tables, we recorded up to six to uh, you know almost 50 percent improvements, x improvements on query execution on S3 listings. Um, so that's 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 big, and the last one being uh, heterogeneous Spark clusters. So now you can not only have dedicated on-demand or dedicated spot instance clusters, but you can also have slave nodes in Spark clusters that can be of any instance types. So that speaks to uh, lowering your TCO depending on use cases. We're also, you know, proud to announce that we scaled up the largest Spark cluster in the cloud. Um, it was launched on uh, Cubol Data Service by one of our customers. It was uh, it scaled up to five, auto scaled up to 500 nodes, equaling, you know, to 16,000 compute cores and um, 120 terabytes of uh, of memory. So just to give you. Uh, you know, in just to kind of in conclusion for this, there's definitely a, a, you know sparks definitely on the rise, and like like Matt alluded to, there's definitely other technologies that play uh, a significant role in the in the bigger picture of the bigger bigger ecosystem. But uh, uh, and then I'm going to have um, Steve come on and then talk a little bit about. Uh, their use cases and how how they're using Spark as well as other technologies uh, within the organization, and this is this is how you. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, here's my email: dash at uh, Twitter handle. And uh, with that, um, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Steve Gottlieb. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you Dash. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dash. Hello, uh, my name is Steve Gottlieb, and I work for Autodesk, I'm part of our big data engineering team, uh, working on uh, engineering and infrastructure for our product development group, uh, but we're building an enterprise-wide analytics system uh, based on Spark uh, running on Cubal. So I'll take some of the ideas that Matt uh, presented about Spark and some of the things that Dash um, discussed uh, regarding how um, um, Cubal can provision uh, and, and, and provide uh, access to Spark and, and how Autodesk is using that. So um, a little bit first about Autodesk, uh, we're a design company, and we've been around since 1982 uh, and have really kind of gone through the evolution of a traditional desktop product that ships floppy disks to, you know, you know moved into the CD, you know, uh, and DVD era, and then, uh, you know, now we're really um, moving into a, a new wave of um, um, a SaaS model uh, and, and, and subscription and lots of uh, web services that are interconnected with our desktop products. So we're 
uh, developing what we're calling a 360 brand of products. And, and these are really lots of products and services that work together to accomplish uh, things that enable um, our customers to, to build. Uh, we're really about making things. And you know, we're software for people who want to build things. So it's, you know, people, uh, companies building cars or buildings, designing a smartphone, uh, effects uh, that we're using for um, uh, uh, special effects for uh, lots of uh, films that have been nominated for special effects Oscars. Uh, so most people have only heard of AutoCAD, but we're a lot more than that. Um, and we are also becoming a data-driven company. And we're, um, we have uh, goals where we want to use data to allow uh, our culture um, to make decisions based on the data we have, to drive machine learning, ad hoc um, data discovery, uh, and decision making uh, based on uh, usage events. Uh, um, we want to have an, a user experience that uh, is is um, is really a good one for the users that has. Uh, adoption of lots of uh, different features in our products uh, can be measured. Uh, we use this data to improve our, our UI uh, for our customers um, and figure out how we can help them optimize their workflows. And uh, another goal of our big data platform is just to support ETL uh, development, which I'm going to get into how we have implemented a self-service model. Uh, so our the Facebook philosophy, which was what uh, the Cubo founders came from, is really uh, built on providing uh, a data infrastructure that can be uh, used across across the company. So we're turning our data assets into a utility, making data collaborative um, uh, so that we can have a large number of employees throughout different parts of the organization that can collaborate and ex access that data. And of course, we need it to be scalable because the more products we have, the more uh, customers, uh, and the more usage of those products, the, the more events we're capturing, and we see an ever-increasing number of, um, uh, 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 ever-increasing amount of data that's being uh, generated through our platform and then accessed by all different groups like product managers, uh, customer support, marketing, uh, and product teams that are um, developing new features. So our requirements were spelled out for our big data platform that we you know, first wanted to enable a data exploration layer. Um, we're, we were, we're good at collecting data. We're, we haven't been very good at making that data widely available uh, for users to explore. It's always been a little difficult in the past um, you know, due to you know, the complexity of tools, the lack of scalability, uh, and other things. And one of the things we wanted to do was have a data exploration layer where users could access different levels of data aggregated and um, uh, data sets uh, it, where most queries would complete in 30 seconds or less. Uh, we also needed to have a multi-tenant environment because we know we have lots of users running uh, queries concurrently around the clock and we want to try and meet that demand um, without users bumping up on each other for resource limitations and so forth. Um, cost, of course, was a uh, consideration as well. We want to be able to maximize our investment. We're running things on AWS, so uh, we want to be able to use the, um, the optimal instance types. Uh, we want to be able to utilize the spot market. And, um, and the other thing out here is the auto-scaling uh, feature that, that Dash mentioned, uh, which really helps us to um, have our uh, system to have our demand uh, drive our system utilization, resource utilization. Uh, and then we wanted to be able to have some support. Um, we needed to be able to onboard users quickly who may not have, you know, Spark is fairly new. A lot of people don't have experience with Spark, but we want to get people up and running. Um, so um, our, you know, establishing relations with, with Cubal support has, has helped us to do that. Um, training uh, also is key, and there's some uh, lots of you know, education um, that we're trying to provide users. So I'm going to walk through a journey of you know, what we've built um, uh, in terms of uh, you know, an abstraction of our pipeline and where we 
found issues and how we've solved them. So um, reading from you know top bottom, top to bottom, left to right, um, we have our instrumentation layer, uh, which in which teams engage and uh, integrate to send their data. And we have we have over 200 product teams. Uh, so and they each have different types of uh, instrumentation, different detailed level of instrumentation, and different things that are important to them to collect. So we have a basic set of um, data, uh, a base schema of required fields that we get from everyone, and then we allow flexibility for products to do some you know, custom inst instrumentation as well. Uh, and then they forward through our, our transport layer to get data into our data lake where it can be accessed by those various teams that are interested in doing that um, and consumed through a self-service layer. So this is the idea that we had our initial implementation, which was built on Amazon EMR, um, had some issues with ingestion was difficult. There was always a slowdown there. Um, hooking up with our transformation layer and, and you know, con configuring uh, any kind of data transformations and then the entire self-service process, you know, of defining and building uh, and getting teams to engage in that was a slowdown. So we solved the problem with uh, um, the slowdown for instrument, instrumenting and, uh, and ingestion by creating a set of SDKs that are uh, written in a, in a variety of languages. Um, we have uh, Java, uh, JavaScript, uh, Node.js, um, uh, Ruby.net, um, probably missing a couple. Um, but um, different languages, uh, different teams can use uh, to forward their data in. And then we have a managed uh, pipe, pipeline where users don't really know, need to know what's going on down um, behind the scenes. We can change out components. Um, you know, right now we're using um, Kafka and uh, Flume in our ingestion pattern. If we if we change that, it's a service that behind the scenes users won't need to do anything. They just have to uh, integrate our SDK, and uh, so that's saved us a lot. Because in the past, when we've had to change things, we'd have to go to 200 teams and have them make configuration changes, and um, it was always painful and difficult to do that. So I'm not going to focus much on this half of it. This is getting data into our system, but I wanted to show that these were the problems we had. The, uh, the other problem around um, data access uh, is where I'm going to focus the rest of my presentation. And what we really want to do is build a true self-service uh, model, which um, will allow teams to engage, define their business requirements, um, and build, um, build data sets that can meet their requirements and validate those data sets. Um, with minimal um, interaction and, and you know, sort of a self-service type of environment. So how do we build self-service analytics? This has been a, a great challenge for us. Um, first, we have to um, highlight what are the, what's the value of a self-service pipeline. Uh, the goal of this is to serve the data users uh, and meet our corporate goals. Um, so we have a lot of needs from the data users, and, and everybody's working to meet you know, our, our, our corporate goals. Um, we don't want to have any kind of barrier for adoption of our pipeline. So you know, teams in the past have gone out and tried to build their own solution. And we want, we're trying to build, uh, and we have built a compelling case uh, for users to adopt our pipeline. Uh, they don't have to build our pay separately uh, for a pipeline. We have one centralized one, um, and that can free up resources to, instead of building a pipeline to create customer value. Uh, we also want, um, want to be able to support analysis across multiple products. So if we have one common platform with a schema that has some commonality between it, we can look at um, Cross product analysis, and you know, figure out how many products are used per users, which products are used most frequently together. You know, how can we improve the customer experience um, um, by understanding how our our products are actually being used? Um, also, with a with a single self service layer, that everyone's using it. Make we can address security and data, data governance in a in a centralized manner. Um, provide standard product metrics and KPIs. Um, we can 
control the, the data quality of our events and our master data um, and have you know, get closer to the single version of the truth. And, and then we can support um, and leverage some sophisticated analytics tools. So our tag is we want to create in, insights, not infrastructure, um, not a, at least not a complicated infrastructure. So, um, so insights, you know, are really you know, designed to um, allow interactive querying, um, which lets pretty much anyone who is comfortable working with data become an analyst, and we want to make those analysts more uh, productive. So we, our solution is interactive querying through Spark, uh, Spark SQL. Um, our BI uh, reporting tools are connecting through JDBC, um, which is running on Hive Server 2 on our cluster. Um, the exploration is through um, SQL. We also support data frames and iterative um, ex exploration. Um, through Spark Notebooks. Um, we'll, our users are, are using SQL, um, Scala, R, and Python, most, mostly Spark, SQL, and Python. Um, um, the notebooks are really for that advanced exploration and resource. And um, you know, we want to you know, scale across our tools. So um, the little bit of our architecture here, and I'll show how this fits in in a few slides down, uh, shows that you know, we're running Kubel with Spark. Um, we're running Spark on Cuba with Zeppelin notebooks. Uh, users are accessing for uh, exploration. Uh, and then we're connecting BI tools currently through a, a virtual layer through Denodo, um, which allows us to connect data sources that are not in our Spark ecosystem and also provides a level of security uh, for some of our um, uh, BI tools to connect to. Um, so. skip over this, the self-service uh, analytics pipeline in detail, again, has all these different components that we've built. And I have an overlay here of um, the different areas that we've dealt with from instrumentation and data transport uh, and, and our data lake. Uh, and then we have a compute layer uh, and um, and you can see here the data lake and compute are separate. So that was touched upon uh, earlier in, in the presentations today uh, where we've decoupled storage and compute. Uh, and we're using S3 for um, storage. Uh, and then our data lake also consists of uh, a Hive Metastore. Um, and, and for compute, we're running um, uh, Spark on Kubel. So we can scale up and down on compute, and our storage is infinite. Uh, we've also abstracted out our um, um, compute versus fast access. Um, and I'll get into that in, in, in a couple of slides. And we have a uh, continuous integration process, which enables our self-service. So underneath uh, the hood uh, of that abstraction layer, um, and this might be a little bit of an eye chart, um, but this gets into a little bit more of the technology that we're using behind the scenes. Uh, we um, are running uh, BI tools uh, like Kubel, Tableau, and Qmetrics to consume data. Uh, and then for our, our building integration, we're using Jenkins and, and, and GitHub. Um, but we really are running three different types of Spark clusters. We have an ETL cluster, a notebook, notebook cluster and fast access clusters, um, and they each serve a separate purpose. Um, ETL cluster is running workflows in batch that are submitted through an Uzi scheduler, and we have auto scaling enabled, and we have separate Spark applications for each workflow so that we can run things concurrently. Um, our notebook clusters are specifically designed just to, for users who are accessing um, uh, our um, through, uh, through Zeppelin notebooks. These are mostly ETL uh, developers and, and data scientists. And we also have auto scaling enabled here. And again, separate Spark applications per users, which allow for a concurrent use. Uh, and then fast access is a separate cluster that we run, uh, which is used for BI tools to access uh, and SQL clients. So this is where Tableau or maybe SQL Workbench or Toad will 
connect uh, through our JDBC connector. And right now we don't have auto scaling enabled because um, we're trying to deal with some issues around Spark caching and how that works with auto scaling. Um, our self-service um, model really fits a variety of users throughout the company. So this is this inverted pyramid diagram shows that at the top most of the majority of users are non-technical. Uh, but as you get further into um, uh, you know, deeper into the data, there's a smaller number of users, but they need access to a finer grain of data. So we have different tool sets that we use uh, for um, users as they go down the stack, and, and, and Cubal is really positioned for our data engineers and data scientists to um, develop ETL and test their logic um, uh, and then uh, deploy through our pipeline. Um, the uh, I earlier referred to our managed uh, Hive Metastore, um, which is a, a central place that where everything is defined as a table. Uh, so we're not you, all users are accessing tables uh, that are defined with, with different schemas, and, and they can easily navigate uh, through um, the Explore browser or any you know browser that has um, that you can show. Um, you know, all of the, the tables in the Metastore. We discover and share through our wiki. Um, we use the Hive Metastore to provide access controls um, um, that's hooked into our LDAP uh, system so we can have fine-grained access controls. Um, we optimize our storage on S3 using reduced redundancy storage, and performance is optimized using our JSON and Parquet file types. Uh, this allows us, uh, I think this slide was a duplicate. Um, this, this slide here is about um, how we deploy the pipeline as a service. So Cubal notebooks are used for data exploration. And once users have come up with a, a working prototype, it can be deployed through our um, ETL pipeline. Uh, so code is submitted to GitHub. Right now it's manual, but we're working on getting um, GitHub integration with our Cubal notebooks. Uh, that goes through code review. So we have a bunch of um, folks who are you know, kind of our Spark experts that are reviewing code that's developed by um, other people within the organization who um, um, have standards that are defined in our wiki. And um, they're, you know, the, the logic, uh, it's tuned, uh, they tune resources, make sure that security, any security concerns are addressed and so forth. And then we have a uh, um, build an automation through Jenkins, which deploys it through our Uzi uh, um, workflow uh, and runs the job through a direct Spark uh, submit through the uh, Cubal API on our ETL cluster. So that is a real quick overview of how we're doing self-service data at Autodesk. Um, I want to thank you for listening. Um, my Email address is here, and I think an earlier slide had my LinkedIn as well. Um, so with that, I'll uh, turn it over for um, – I'll, I'll turn this back to Matt for uh, questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Steve. That was a fantastic presentation. And uh, I think we'll, we'll let you uh, get your breath back for, for a second. Um, and just remind everyone, uh, if you've got questions, you can submit them using the chat on the left-hand side. And we've already got quite a few good ones. We've got a, only a small amount of time left, so perhaps we'll, we'll try and get through as many as we can. So the first one, well, I'll let Steve uh, just, uh, to get his breath back. The first one I'll address to, uh, to Dash. Uh, so a question, so if um, storage is, is decoupled, uh, uh, as, as you talked about, how does that, what are the implications, therefore, in terms of the IO, IO, uh, sorry, IO bottleneck? Um, you know, the question's, makes the point that you know the reason for bringing compute to the storage was was to avoid that issue so so how how was that addressed uh, in, in cubo in particular oh uh, yeah I, that, I think that's a great question uh, the the key here to uh, keep in mind is that even though the storage is uh, you know separated or decoupled from from compute everything uh, you, including the cluster is still running within the same VPC or the subnet so you wouldn't really see uh, that big of a performance or a latency uh, issue uh, from that point of view. I, I don't know if it is that 
Does that answer the question? Right. Yeah, and, and perhaps actually yeah. just uh, in relation to that, there's another question um, asking about the, you know, the performance of the system in terms of latency and throughput, how that changes with, in, with increased number of nodes. So obviously, obviously related. Or if you want to address that one quickly while we're, while we're topic. Right. So the the increased number of nodes would, um, you know, we definitely depend on the, the use case. The nodes are brought up only if, for example, the uh, the Spark jobs uh, would require in a Spark cluster, for example, if they require either more containers or more executors, right? So reading from S3, per connection, there's a max amount of throughput. So more tasks on more nodes, which it actually means better read throughput. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. And, and next question, uh, Steve, for you. Um, well, uh, in, in general, I mean, I was just interested in, in what were the challenges you faced in terms of you know, moving to the self-service approach that you described. But we did have one question in particular which asked about how you dealt with master data, um, master data governance in, in, in relation to that architecture and self-service analytics. So, you know, I don't know if that fits specifically into the challenges you had, but I wonder if you could talk about that. Sure, yeah, I'll address both of those. So with, um, you know, in terms of master data governance, uh, we have our SDKs which enforce uh, a schema uh, and we also have a, a validation tool that um, we run uh, on the ingested data to make sure that it, you know, the data coming in is, you know, meets certain types of rules that we don't have um, uh, any, any, any bad data. Um, and, you know, that the required fields are included uh, in our, um, you know, incoming data that we ingest. Uh, and having a, a common schema you know, really helps because the problem we had before was we had, you know, 200 different teams all instrumenting calling a user ID something different. And, you know, now we've standardized that and, uh, you know, have, you know, an evolving schema that can um, meet the growing needs and also um, help us to govern our master data. Um, the, some of the challenges that we've had have been more around, um, I would say three challenges, uh, you know, self-service. Uh, and I saw another question about this, which was what kind of team do, would we need to manage uh, our analytics pipeline? And, you know, this is one of the challenges we've had is that this requires much more support than we expected. You know, we knew that there would be a lot of support required when you're bringing on users um, who are brand new to Spark, teams, you know, um, new to ETL even. And uh, so there is some hand-holding, uh, and we consider it an investment up front to get, you know, build a lot of strong uh, data analysts. There will be some things that are suboptimal that are implemented, and, you know, yeah, that's, that's a challenge to deal with. And then concurrent usage uh, is another challenge that we've had, uh, and, and Cubal's really helped work with us on this one, which is um, the solution was to have separate Spark applications per user, uh, which uh, on a shared cluster, um, which allow us to leverage um, Yarn uh, for uh, resource allocation, and we can provide you know, um, you know isolated resources to users if we need to, and we can have a, a shared resource pool um, using the um, fair scheduler uh, in Yarn. Uh, and then the third challenge is just some tool incompatibility. Um, there's you know with Spark still being a fairly um, young technology. There's some um, tools out there that BI tools, for example, that people are using that um, don't support that. So, um, and there are also challenges around how different um, tools um, generate queries when you're running large queries against big data sets, um, you know, and are trying to set the expectations around what, what, what the latency um, should be. Great, thanks. And uh, you mentioned one of the challenges, uh, challenges there around, around skills, and that actually relates to one of the questions we got uh, was asking me about <laughs> so a, another analyst company pointing out that there are challenges to Hadoop adoption in general, and one of the things that relates to that are skills. And, uh, and it was a good question. I wanted to, to, to point that out. I mean, we certainly see those same challenges that, that Steve discussed there uh, also apply clearly to, to Spark. In relation to skills, I mean, you talked about getting up to speed there. I was wondering if you actually um, sent any of your team to, to training with Cubol in terms of help, you know, helping get up to speed quickly. 
We have. We sent um, our entire, we have a development team in, in Singapore, and they did a custom training over there. Uh, and um, I've encouraged our users to take advantage of the training, um, the public courses offered, and also leverage um, uh, some of the other uh, classes and we're working on trying to, to schedule additional training um, and make that even a requirement for users um, to get on our, our platform. Great. Okay. And um, yeah, I think uh, we're pretty much out of time now. I know there are other questions that have, that have come in, um, but uh, I'm not sure we're going to get a, a chance to address them. I'm sure we can, we can obviously uh, follow up um, and we'll, we'll share those questions out between the team and make sure those get addressed. But I think for now, I um, would like to thank everyone, obviously, for, for joining us on, on this webinar. And uh, yeah, thank you all very much for your time.